I welcome you on behalf of the leadership of both organizations, former Congressman Mel Levine, former Supervisor Zevi Arslavsky, Caroline Kenny, Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chasen, Janice, and myself. In a moment, Janice will introduce tonight's program, but I'd like to call your attention to two of our upcoming evenings. Next week, September 9th, we'll be hosting a very timely speaker, one of the mavens on political polling, what they mean and what they don't mean, CNN senior political analyst and editorial director of The Atlantic, Ron Brownstein. The past few weeks have seen a flood of polls, some with seemingly ambiguous results. If there is anyone uh, in the media that you would want, in the media world that you would want to give his analysis of what it means, it's Ron Brownstein. He will be interviewed by our good friend and our most frequent moderator, Warren Olney of KCRW, who will be making his sixth appearance in this series. The following week, we'll have another incredibly timely dialogue with California Secretary of State, Alex Padilla. He will discuss a headline-making topic, voting by mail, absentee ballots, and the truth about efforts at voter suppression, who's doing what to whom and why. He'll be interviewed by a man who knows something about elections and how they work, our own former supervisor, Zevyar Slavsky. We're grateful to our co-sponsors, Valley Beth Shalom, Temple Israel of Hollywood, Ikar, Stephen Wise Temple, Center, the Jewish Center for Justice, Temple Beth Am, the LA Museum of the Holocaust, Leo Beck Temple, Temple Isaiah, and the national newspaper, The Forward. We thank you for your continuing comments and financial support. Your guilt, gifts help make these programs possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend of over 40 years, Janice Kamina Resnick, with whom it has been a privilege to collaborate. She is indefatigable, smart, effective, and a pleasure to work with, a pretty rare combination. She's the founder of Jews United for Democracy and Justice. Janice? Thank you, David. I feel the same way about you. It's wonderful for all of us to be together. Though the impetus for this series was COVID-19, and we are mindful of the fact that, that since we started this series, almost 100,000 Americans have died from the pandemic. We hope you are all healthy and making the best of these difficult times. Tonight's program has broken our prior registration records with 5,000 people having signed up to hear our great speakers tonight. I could spend the entire hour telling you all about Jeffrey Tubin's career, but in his honor, I will give you the Cliff Notes version. Jeff is a two-time Harvard grad, and while in law school, he was editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review. He is known as a brilliant constitutional and legal scholar and as an equally brilliant writer. He started his legal career with the Office of the Independent Counsel during the Iran-Contra affair, seems like a million years ago, that he went on to work as a U.S. attorney. In 1993, he began writing for The New Yorker, which as many of you already know, he continues to do to this day. And he, is also, he also then began a career as a television legal analyst, first with ABC and then later with CNN, a position which we all know he holds to this day. Jeff is a prolific writer, having authored seven books, and I think they were all bestsellers. This last month, his newest book, High Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Investigation of Donald Trump, was released. We provided the link in several emails, and many of you purchased this book, and I recommend that you all do. Like Jeff, oh, it's great to have you with us, Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, like Jeff, uh, Henry Weinstein is also a notorious underachiever. He, too, is no stranger to most of us. Henry is a veteran legal journalist and professor at UC Irvine School of Law. He has worked as a legal journalist for the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the San Francisco Examiner, and the Wall Street Journal. Henry has written more than 3,000 stories connected to the law, reporting on the ground from 36 states, plus the District of Columbia and Canada. He also has written about events and issues in other countries and for a variety of publications, including California Lawyer, Juris Doctor, The Nation, New Times, the Saturday Review of Education, and the Saturday Review of Science. It's wonderful to have both of you with us tonight. And now I hand the program over to Henry. Thanks, Janice. First, I want to thank uh, Jews United for Justice and Democracy and Community Advocates uh, for putting on this series and for giving me the opportunity to share a platform with Jeff Tubin, who I first met 25 or 26 years ago when we were both uh, spending time covering the trial of O.J. Simpson and related events. Um, so let me get right to the heart of the matter since we've got a lot to talk about here. Um, on May the 10th, 2017, President Trump fired FBI Director James Comey. That 
firing set the stage for a series of events which are the subject of Jeff's book. One week, just one week afterward, um, Robert Mueller was appointed to be the special counsel for to investigate the question of Russian involvement in the U.S. election in 2016 and whether Trump campaign people were involved with Russian government officials. When Trump heard that news, he said to a friend, and I can't quote all the words, that he thought it was dreadful and this would probably mean the end of his presidency. Um, it turned out to not be the case. And in fact, Jeff's book is an artful dissection of why a man who Jeff characterizes as nothing more than a narcissistic scoundrel was apparently able to get the best of a decorated Marine, a man who had led the FBI for uh, a number of years, had been a United States attorney, um, and was considered by some people to have almost a saintly status in the legal world. Um, it's, 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 also, it's a depressing story about the contemporary state of, of American politics and American law. Um, Jeff brings considerable experience to this particular topic. As Janice said, Jeff's first book, Opening Arguments, was about his stint um, working on the special, with special independent counsel, Lawrence Walk, on the Iran-Contra affair, and then some years later, Jeff wrote a book called A Vast Conspiracy, which was about the failed efforts of Kenneth Starr, uh, independent counsel, to take down President Clinton over a sex scandal. So that brings us to the present moment. Um, and Jeff, I'd like to ask you first, tell us what your bottom line is of, of this story, of the Mueller, of the Mueller Trump story. Uh, well, there, there, um, first of all, hi, Henry, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you all for having me. This is a, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to talk to you all. I, I wish it could be in person. Um, you know, as, as Henry mentioned, you know, I spent several years of my life covering the OJ case, and I developed a great love for Los Angeles, and I've spent a great deal of time there over the years. And uh, one of the many reasons I'm sorry about how we're living today is that I don't get to, uh, I don't get to go back to LA and who knows when I really will be, but, uh, um, but this is a, this is a, uh, a good substitute or, or it's, it's, it's the best we can do. So what's my bottom line? Well, I mean, that's, that's a, uh, um, an admirably broad question to, to begin with. I mean, I, I think that uh, the Mueller investigation was uh, an honorable, competent exercise. I, I think uh, Mueller um, did not view his job as um, to bring down the president. I think it, it, that's, that's, a, that's not a standard uh, that it's fair to judge him by. I think um, the Mueller investigation accomplished a great deal. There were several successful prosecutions of important people, Michael Flynn, the National Security Advisor, uh, Paul Manafort, Trump's campaign chair, Rick Gates, the deputy campaign chair, Roger Stone, the president's friend. So, um, you know, th there were many successes. You know, as I write in True Crimes and Misdemeanors, um, th there were serious uh, mistakes, I think, that, that Mueller made, and perhaps we'll discuss those. You know, the two most important of which were the failure to issue a grand jury subpoena for Trump's testimony and the failure to articulate clearly in the Mueller report that Trump committed the crime of obstruction of justice. You know, I do think those were serious failures. I don't think, given the state of our contemporary politics, that had Trump, uh, had Mueller uh, done something different, had he um, not made those mistakes, that there would have been 67 votes in the Senate to remove Trump. I don't think that would have happened under any circumstances, but I do think those were errors by Trump. And um, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, by Mueller. And, and I think they, they, they were consequential, but you know, I, I don't feel that it's fair to describe the Mueller investigation as, as a failure, because I don't think it was one. Okay. So the, the Mueller team seemed to get off to a very good start, as you write, in 2017, they indicted Paul Manafort, they were moving forward. And late in the year, um, as you describe, 
they basically uh, persuaded uh, White House counsel Don McGahn to admit that Trump had asked him to fire Mueller, which, see, which would seem to be a clear example of obstruction of justice. So at that point, they seemed to be doing very well. What went wrong after that? Well, I, I think um, one of, the, one of the, the, the key factors here uh, was that right around that time, at the end of 2017, towards the beginning of 2018, was, the, was, the, was really the, the first crunch time on the issue of whether uh, Mueller would try to force Trump to testify. Would he issue a grand jury subpoena? And um, th they, they got so far as to tentatively agree on a date when Trump would testify at the end of January at Camp David. But at the last minute, or close to the last minute, John Dowd, who was then Trump's lead lawyer, um, pulled the plug and said he wouldn't do it. I mean, he, and he, he didn't do it for the same reason that defense lawyers often uh, don't let their clients cooperate with law enforcement, is because they know they'll lie because they're criminals and they don't, and, and they don't want to expose their clients to that sort of risk. At that moment, um, that was really the moment when Trump, when, when Mueller could have issued a grand jury subpoena because, you know, he, he was very concerned uh, from the very start that this was going to be an efficient and um, relatively uh, short investigation by the standards of white collar crime. Both Kenneth Starr, the independent counsel for Whitewater and Lewinsky, and, and Lawrence Walsh, for whom I worked on the Iran-Contra, spent you know, five plus years on the investigation. And Mueller was determined not to do that. But if he had issued a grand jury subpoena in January of 2018, he probably could have gotten a resolution on that issue from the Supreme Court by June of 2018 just a year into his tenure. And I think that would have been um, a, a, a fully appropriate use uh, of his subpoena power and would have given his investigation the central focus and the central voice that it needed. But, but Mueller um, decided not to do that. He decided to continue negotiating with, with uh, Trump's lawyers. And those negotiations, as defense lawyers like to do, stretched out on and on uh, throughout most of 2018. And by the time they got a hard no from, from, Mueller's lawyer, from, from Trump's lawyers, who were then led by Rudy Giuliani, it was the fall of 2018. And Mueller did not want to begin a year-long litigation at that point. So he settled for questions and answers written questions and answers, um, and only on the subject of uh, what went on before Trump became president. And that, I thought, was a very poor substitute, and I thought was, was a, a central failure of, of the office, and actually uh, a significant success by uh, Trump's lawyers in how they handled it. You, you also described this period, you're, you're clearly not an admirer of, of Rudy Giuliani, but you present Giuliani, at least in regard to this probe as distinct from the Ukraine matter, as having played, a, it seems like a significant role in turning the tide, a more aggressive outward posture toward the public, more, more brandishing of terms like witch hunt and so on and so forth. Talk a little bit more about that, if you will. Well, you know, I, I mean, Henry, you know, one of the reasons I write these books is, um, you know, to, 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 you know, try to inform the public about significant political issues. But, you know, mostly I'm a storyteller and mostly I like narrative. Mostly the reason I write these books is because they're interesting stories and they have great characters. And that's really, you know, the, the reading experience that I'm looking for um, from my readers. And you cannot invent a better character than Rudy Giuliani. I mean, he was, you know, such a, um, you know, both charismatic and loathsome figure at the same time. And what made him so interesting and what I find interesting as a journalist is that his role was complicated and in many respects contradictory. You know, I, I, as I implied in my earlier answer, the way he strung out the negotiations 
with some pretty effective lawyering. In addition, and this was a cynical move, but I think uh, an effective one, he um, went on television repeatedly, usually with Sean Hannity, but not only, sometimes with CNN, and he demonized uh, Mueller and Mueller's team. And he created an image of Mueller that folded Mueller into the political polarization that we live in. It's important to remember when Mueller was, was appointed in May of 2017, there was bipartisan support for him and bipartisan respect. You know, Mueller had been a, uh, you know, a, a Republican political appointee in the George Herbert Walker Bush administration. George W. Bush made him FBI director. Um, I mean, he was universally respected. But once Trump, but, but once Giuliani got his, his teeth into him, he started to be seen as just another Trump enemy. And that had real negative consequences for, for, for Mueller in terms of you know, his place in the political and legal firmament. And that you know, was a cynical and rather effective technique, even though I thought, and many people thought, uh, Giuliani looked cartoonish and sometimes even crazy on television. But I think there was an element where he was crazy like a fox. Now, as you said, Henry, perhaps we'll discuss this at another time. I thought Giuliani's role when it came to the whole um, Ukraine matter was a catastrophic failure and disastrous and incompetent and awful. But the fact that he was effective when it came to Mueller and Russia, I think you have to acknowledge. All right, thanks. So as I read your book, one of the things that was the most striking was that, was your focus on Mueller's personality and how Mueller's personality his um, self-image, as you described him, a near lifer from the, in the Justice Department who didn't want to stray too far out of his lane, that seemed to be very significant in the way that he handled the matter, both in regard to the subpoena that you referred to before. Could you talk a little bit more about, about Mueller and, and how he operated? Well, I mean, you know, again, this is, this is why I like writing these books, because you get to write about these, these fascinating figures, and Mueller is one of them. You know, I, I begin the book with uh, the one and only face-to-face -face meeting be between Donald Trump and um, Robert Mueller, uh, May 16th, 2000, 2017, at the White House, where um, Mueller is brought in to give advice on who should be the next FBI director. The two men have more than you would think in common. Uh, born within two years of each other during World War II, both slightly pre-baby boomers, both from wealthy families. Tr uh, Mueller's father was an executive at DuPont, both well-educated in the Ivy League, Penn for, for Trump, Princeton for, for uh, Mueller. But as soon as they graduated, they, their paths diverged, and they diverged in the crucible of their generation, which was Vietnam. You know, Robert Mueller didn't just enlist to, to, to be a Marine in Vietnam. He waited two years until a knee recovery, in, until a knee injury uh, was, re had recovered to enlist in the Marine Corps. That's how much he wanted to go be a Marine and fight in Vietnam. As I think many people know, Donald Trump engaged in all sorts of artifice to, do to dodge the draft. And, and I think that, set the tone for the completely different paths they've spent, they, they, they led as adults. Uh, Donald Trump has never been about anything except Donald Trump. Robert Mueller has devoted his life to a series of American institutions, the Marine Corps, the FBI, the Justice Department. And he, he has had a gene for public service that really has dominated his life. But you know what makes these stories so interesting, I think, is that sometimes people's greatest uh, attribute can also turn out to be their greatest weakness. And I think Mueller's respect for American institutions, especially the Justice Department, led him to make some decisions here that I think um, re reflected a certain degree of undue deference to those institutions and uh, limited his effectiveness as special counsel. You also say, I mean, he clearly played it by the book 
in terms of how he dealt with the public. I mean, Starr's office leaked like a sieve, which you describe in great right. detail in your book, A Vast Conspiracy. There was nary a leak from the Mueller office. It was absolutely really stunning in a, in a case like this. I mean, they did talk about their work and what in, in the indictments they would go into detail. But one of the things that you say that I thought was very interesting is that you said that by sort of staying in the shadows, by not emerging as a public figure, that it sort of created a situation where people could create their own fantasies about what Mueller was gonna do. There were nights when you'd watch MSNBC and you'd think Robert Mueller was gonna save the United States. Right, that, that, that's right. And, and, and um, you know, he, he, um, he, he, he entered, I mean, he, he's been a public figure for a long time, but he ma entered the real political maelstrom for the first time uh, in, 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 as, as special counsel. And um, through Giuliani on the right and, you know, MSNBC on the left, you know, he was turned into something he was not. He was not a, a political partisan. He was not someone determined to bring down Donald Trump. And, you know, the, 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 the cult of Mueller, you know, the, the Robert Mueller action figures and the Mueller time t-shirts, you know, that was the projection of, you know, people who hated Trump, and there are certainly a lot of people like that, who were determined that this would be it. This would be the vehicle finally to bring him down. And that's not, who Mueller was, I think Mueller correctly saw them saw that was not not his role as special counsel, but um, you know his his public silence uh, allowed all of these fantasies to be projected. I mean, his public silence also allowed you know Rudy Giuliani to and the president to portray him and his staff as uh, a bunch of angry Democrats when in fact they were all experienced prosecutors. And um, I, I think Mueller's failure, even once, to defend his himself and his staff, did contribute to um, you know his demonization. And I think that was a big uh, you know that that was you know he he is not someone I think who should have been involved in the day to day political fray, but but his silence was so extreme that I think it had a cost for him as well. Yes, I think that's I think that's a, that's a very good point. Let's go back to the subpoena a question for just a second, because as you said, ultimately he decided not to subpoena him and that basically that, uh, that, a, that a deal was arranged that Trump would give written answers, um, which meant that the lawyers, I think, or you can explain this, would probably write the answers and would protect Trump. I mean, was, was that sort of a surrender? Yes, I mean, I think it was an absolute surrender. And I, I mean, this is a big part of the book, the whole saga of, you know, the subpoena and the, and the, and the, and, the, and you know, which turned into these written questions and answers. And, um, you know, I, I am sure in a sophisticated audience like this, you know, a lot of people have had dealings with lawyers one way or another. And, you know, when you ask a lawyer a question and you ask a lawyer to respond, they will respond in a lawyerly way. They will protect their client. And you know what happened here was um, there were two of the less celebrated uh, members of the Trump defense team, a husband and wife from Miami named Jane and Marty Raskin, very good lawyers, who took it upon themselves to get the questions um, that Mueller asked, assemble the documentary record you know, the emails, the text messages, the memos, the, the statements by other people, and see what was provable by Mueller. And then when they went to ask Trump the questions and, you know, get his initial responses, they could craft answers that could not be disproved by uh, the, the documentary record. In addition, again, as I think a sophisticated audience like this would know, is that if you say, I don't remember, if you say, I don't recall, as Trump said, I believe 31 times in the course of answering these questions, it's very hard to disprove that. And so, you know, the, the written answers to Trump's, to the questions were almost useless as an investigatory tool. So, and one of the other things is when you have written questions, 
as distinct from being in a room questioning somebody, there's no opportunity for follow up. Well, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and you know, many of the questions and many of the answers that Trump gave, you know, cried out for follow ups, but they didn't give them any. Right. So let's jump to the 448 page Mueller report, which contained a great deal of information, but as you say, was written in a fashion that was hardly accessible to the American public. Um, and Mueller chose not to write any kind of a, uh, of a summary, you know, like even a, an accessible summary to people, that wouldn't have violated any lawyer's ethics, would it? Well, I, I mean, I, I, the, the Mueller report, um, you know, I, ha, always reminded me of um, the, the famous Stephen Hawking book, A Brief History of Time, which was purchased in great numbers as the Mueller report was, but I think read by, by, many, fewer, by many fewer people. It was not an easy read. It was, it was extremely dense. It was written um, uh, in, in a very deadpan manner. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's perhaps a little too easy to criticize the Mueller report uh, because, um, I mean, it's a remarkable piece of work. I mean, the level of detail, the level of, of um, you know, research involved and the thoroughness is, is extraordinary. And, and just, you know, even in the first part, which is about Russia and, and the relationship with the Trump campaign, you know, the idea that anyone could say at this late date that Russia did not try to help Trump win the 2016 election is completely absurd because uh, Mueller did such an extraordinary job nailing down that nailing down that part of the case. Uh, the part of the uh, of the report that I have a major quarrel with is the second half, where again Mueller did an extraordinarily meticulous job in establishing how Trump committed the crime of obstruction of justice. Far worse, in my opinion that anything Richard Nixon did in Watergate, which wound up, you know, for, where he wound up being forced from office, far worse than anything Bill Clinton did, uh, which wound up getting him impeached. Um, you know, Mueller, you know, his, his attempt to, um, you know, manipulate James Comey as FBI director, his attempt to get Homey, Comey to um, go easy on Michael Flynn, his firing of Comey when Comey wouldn't go easy on Michael Flynn, his, uh, pre the president's uh, instruction to Don McGahn to, to fire, uh, to, get, to get Mueller fired, and then his instruction to McGahn to lie about that whole encounter. All of that, I think, you know, is classic obstruction of justice. But Mueller, again, with this institutional regard that he had, came up with this really convoluted reason why he could not simply say Trump committed the crime of obstruction of justice. And I think that deference to the president and to the Department of Justice policy was an example of how uh, Mueller's regard for institutions uh, led him to um, make a, a, a very serious error. Right, well, I don't mean to be harsh on Mueller. I guess what I was struck by when I was reading the book and I've read, you know, significant part of the report, but not as much as you was, you know, he takes this, you know, he took the position that, you know, that he wasn't, that a, that a sitting president couldn't be indicted because of an office of legal counsel opinion. But, and then he said his reason was for not saying that he would have indicted him, but for that was that Trump would have no chance to respond. But that seems like a rather peculiar answer because this wasn't an indictment and Trump had every television network he wanted um, to, to, to attempt to rebut that in public. So I guess, I guess my question to you about this is, it seems to me like he was a bit too cautious and also naive about what Trump would do. I think that's fair. I, I mean, I, th I think that, and, and there's another, another problem with that, but just, just to, to spell out what you see. I mean, the, his reason was why he didn't just say Trump committed the crime of obstruction of justice is 
many people may remember, there is a Department of Justice policy established in the 1970s that the President of the United States under our constitutional system should not be prosecuted criminally by the Department of Justice while he's in office. I happen to think that policy is correct. A lot of my liberal friends disagree with me about that. I think there is no way you could have under our constitutional system, our, a president sitting in a jury, you know, you know, waiting, you know, in a courtroom all day, every day while he's on trial. Um, but that's the policy. And, and, and Mueller, I think correctly, was bound by that. But he went a step further. He said, as you suggested, Henry, um, because I can't indict Mueller, because I, Mueller, can't indict Trump, I, um, Trump cannot have his day in court to respond. So it would be unfair for me to essentially make that accusation. But as you point out, Henry, he, he had every opportunity to respond to that accusation. Now, what made the pre, uh, Mueller's failure to articulate the obstruction of justice um, prosecution rationale clearly was that he allowed William Barr, the attorney general, to define the conclusion in his own way. Instead of Mueller announcing the conclusion, he turned it over to William Barr. And I think Mueller didn't recognize what a political actor, what a partisan Barr had become and has become, and thus allowed Barr to distort what, what Mueller had found. And then, wait a month to release the actual report. So if you remember what happened, on, on a, a Sunday afternoon in uh, March, uh, Barr announced that, that the report had come in and he said, in my conclusion, I have concluded, Attorney General Barr, that there was no collusion and no obstruction of justice. That was not Mueller's conclusion. But then there was a month before the actual result report was released. And during that month, the conventional wisdom hardened that this whole thing was no big deal. And that was a political calculation by Barr that I think was really shameful in his um, distortion and political posturing about it. But it's also something Mueller could have anticipated and uh, should have tried to guard against. So as you know better than most, any story like this is a moving target. It's not a story that ended when um, Mueller issued his report or when Mueller went to Congress. Why don't you talk a little bit about Ukraine and some of the other recent developments like the report of the, uh, Senate, uh, of the Senate committee about Russia? Well, I mean, all you really have to know about um, the, the two stories is the extraordinary uh, uh, events of July 24th and July 25th, 2019. You know, July 24th was the day that Mueller finally testified before Congress. And I think we can all agree, those who, who remember, is that Mueller did a pretty poor job. Uh, he didn't want to be there. Um, he was physically diminished from what, what he had once been. And it was a, a somber and not very successful uh, postscript, final act of a distinguished public career. What happens when bullies get away with things is they continue bullying. And they, uh, when they're not stopped, their behavior accelerates. So the following morning, July 25th, 2019, President Trump has his infamous phone call with the new president of Ukraine, President Zelensky. And that's where he says, you know, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to get dirt on Joe Biden, or in effect, you're not gonna get the aid that you need to fight the war against Russia. This, and, and you know, I should add, this was not just one phone call. You know, many, the president and many of his president and defenders said, you know, at the time of his impeachment, oh, this was uh, just you know, one phone call. You can't impeach someone for one phone call. This was an entire campaign to manipulate this vulnerable Russian, uh, Ukrainian government for the, the, the ends that, uh, the political ends of the president. 
and and you know one of the things that that I you know feel very strongly about having studied this is that you know even though the Ukraine story has sort of vanished faster even than the Mueller story, the president's conduct there was worse than it was in the in, in the Russia story, for for this precise reason because you know the the impeachment provisions in the Constitution were designed to prevent the abuse of power. That's the whole purpose. You know, anybody can commit obstruction of justice. I could commit obstruction of justice. Henry could commit obstruction of justice. Only a president can abuse his power. And to take congressionally authorized funds and use it as a lever, as a wedge, as a tool to extract purely political gain from a vulnerable foreign country. That to me is such an abuse of power, is such a, um, uh, a, a um, misuse of the enormous authority that a president has. It was entirely appropriate that the, the House of Representatives impeached him for it. You know, the, the Senate acquitted him, which I think is testament more to the current state of the Republican Party than the state of the evidence against Trump. But I just think it is worth focusing on remembering just how bad the, the, Iranian, the Ukrainian chapter of this story is. So Trump escapes twice, basically you're saying. And so now we're at the, we're at the, pre we're at the present moment. He, um, as you were saying, when bullies get away with things, they continue to do them, act with impunity. So. You've, you've studied Trump a lot. You've studied his, his personality. So I will ask you to engage in at least one bit of speculation. If, if Biden wins, what do you think Trump will do? Well, I, I mean, you, you, I, there, 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 there are a variety of questions there. You mean, do you think he will surrender the presidency? That's one question, yeah. Well, yeah, I, the answer is I think yes. Uh, you know, I, I, the, Trump is a bully. And when, when bullies are confronted, they tend to back down. The, the problem is when they're not confronted. And if there are, you know, 270 plus electoral votes um, that, 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 you know, are, 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 are clearly in Biden's favor, he's gonna be out there. He, he will have no uh, recourse. Now, you know, the, we, we all know, and I'm writing a big New Yorker article about this now about the various you know, machinations in connection with the vote counting that, that may go on. But, you know, if there is a dispositive result here, Trump will leave office. I, I do not think if Biden wins that the Department of Justice will or should prosecute Donald Trump. I mean, I, I think Joe Biden has a, a long agenda if he becomes president. And if his Justice Department were to prosecute the, the, the former president, that would suck all the oxygen out of Washington. That would uh, dominate the political discourse. And I don't think uh, it would do um, uh, Joe Biden uh, any good. So I don't think there is any chance the Department of Justice will wind up prosecuting Trump. The, the New York authorities are a different story. Cyrus Vance, the, the Manhattan District Attorney, um, you know, he is the one who won the case in the Supreme Court. Uh, to get access to Trump's financial records and his tax returns. Uh, that case is still kicking around, but I, I think it, 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 he is on his way to getting those papers. We'll see what they show. I mean, a lot of the people who hate Trump sort of assume that there is evidence of crimes in those, in those uh, papers. I, I, I think that is far less clear, but I don't think that uh, Vance, the Manhattan District Attorney or the Attorney General of New York, uh, Tish James will feel constrained in the same way that uh, the federal government will be under um, under a Biden administration. And I do think there is a realistic possibility for a prosecution there if there's the evidence there to support it. So how much damage do you think William Barr has done to the Justice Department? And if and if Biden gets elected, what's what's the repair job look like? Well, you know, I, I, I have a special um, uh, feeling on, on this subject because uh, even though I was at a very low level and only served for about three years, I was an assistant U.S. attorney. I was part of the Department of Justice. 
and uh, I learned and absorbed a great deal about the culture there. And, um, you know, the, the, the Department of Justice, I think, is a wonderful American institution. Uh, everybody who works in the Department of Justice understands that the Attorney General is a political appointee, just as they understand that U.S. attorneys are, are political appointees. But at the same time, there's a culture, there are norms in the Justice Department where, to a really great extent, um, the, the, the tradition has been to operate in a relatively politically neutral way. And the way Barr has perverted that tradition, whether, whether it was, you know, um, you know, distorting the Mueller report or, you know, intervening for the only times in his tenure as attorney general, um, to try to overturn Michael Flynn's guilty plea. I, it, it, to this day, I keep trying to find out, has the Department of Justice ever tried to overturn a guilty plea, you know, someone who pleaded guilty twice? Um, and I've never been able to find it. He intervened to try to get Roger Stone, the president's friend, a lesser sentence. Uh, he's launched this Durham investigation to try to discredit uh, the Russia investigation. You know, he, he has been, uh, even today on CNN, I was, I was part, of this pro part of this coverage, you know, he keeps backing up the president's uh, ludicrous uh, um, denunciations of, of the vote by mail process. I mean, the way he has, um, you know, used his enormous power uh, for partisan ends has really been shameful. You know, I am confident uh, in the DNA of the Justice Department, and if Biden were to put in someone who was going to respect those traditions. Um, I, I don't think um, that the damage there is permanent, but it, it's been an ugly time and um, it, 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 it should end. So speaking of controversial lawyers, one member of the audience asked, why do you think that Alan Dershowitz is so aligned with Trump? Well, you know, um, on, my, on my first day of my, on the first morning of my first day as a student at Harvard Law School, at 8.30 in the morning, I had Alan Dershowitz for criminal law. And, um, you know, I, and I have, so I have known Alan for more than 30 years. And I, I, I have a great deal of residual affection for Alan. Um, I, um, I, I, you know, I, he, he was, a, I was very fond of him as a teacher. You know, I, I covered him through his involvement in several high profile cases, including of course, OJ Simpson. And then of course our paths crossed here. And, you know, I have been as perplexed as anyone by, you know, not just his antipathy for prosecutors because he is a civil libertarian and he has, you know, you know usually uh, been anti-prosecutor. But, you know, his embrace of Trump has gone well beyond uh, simply a civil liberties perspective. And I would, I would attribute it to two, well, three things. One, you know, Henry, you wouldn't know anything about this, but, you know, sometimes when people get older, they get more like themselves. Now, a young man like you, you wouldn't know anything about that. But, you know, Alan is now in his early 80s. And, you know, he's crankier and angrier than he used to be. Um, Second is, you know, I think he is deeply embittered and angered by the Jeffrey Epstein situation. And, and, and again, as I'm sure many of you know, you know, he was involved in representing Jeffrey Epstein, uh, the financier who was, you know, accused of terrible conduct with young women. And he personally has been accused of um, you know, having sexual involvement with some of these women, which he has vigorously and, and endlessly denied. But I think uh, that's been a very embittering process for him. The third thing, age, Epstein, is Israel. You know, later in life, um, Alan has become um, not just a supporter of Israel, he's always been uh, a supporter of Israel, but he has become very much aligned with the right wing. In Israel, whether it's Netanyahu or Sheldon Adelson, um, you know, here here in the United States, you know, I, I think um, his involvement with the right wing in Israel has embittered him towards 
the, 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 the Democratic Party in the United States uh, in the belief that uh, only Republicans can be trusted to stand by Israel. I'm not going to engage on that subject now. I'm sure many people in the audience have strong feelings on it. But I think it is one area where uh, Alan, um, it has led to Alan's estrangement uh, from his customary political views. One of, right. You said you were currently working on an article related to the various potential machinations of things that could affect the election. In recent days, the president um, clearly is trying to make himself the law and order candidate to uh, persuade uh, you know, the people in the country that he will uh, uh, prevent them, uh, save them from violence. Um, his own uh, longtime aide, Kellyanne Conway, said that uh, rioting and anarchy were good for the, good for the president's campaign. Um, in the course of your reporting, one of the people in the audience wants to know, have you seen any evidence of any links between uh, right-wing uh, right protesters on the Trump administration? You know, it, it's funny. It's sort of, uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of, of the collusion um, discussion about Russia and the Trump campaign. You know, one thing we know uh, from, um, you know, Mueller and the intelligence agencies is that Russia was all in for Trump. And there were, they made efforts, they, they hacked emails, they engaged in social media campaigns. We know too that Trump um, expressed support for the Russian efforts on his behalf. But there was never a meeting of the minds that, that Mueller or anyone, anyone else could identify. It, 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 it's, it's, I think, a somewhat analogous situation here uh, with the, you know, the Boogaloo groups and the, and the, and the right-wing activists. You know, they, they ride through Portland and Kenosha with Trump banners. I mean, it's not any mystery, you know, whose side they're on. And, you know, this, this 17 year old Rittenhouse who, um, who, who shot, who apparently shot the, killed two people uh, in Kenosha and, and shot another, you know, he was an active uh, Trump supporter. So there's no doubt that they were, uh, that, that it's Trump supporters who were engaged in, in some of these activities. What has Trump done? Well, Trump has said very supportive things about Rittenhouse. He has refused to criticize um, the, the, uh, the people driving through Portland, firing paintballs at Black Lives Matters, Matters protesters. But, you know, has he actively encouraged them? Has, has he, you know, agreed with them in some uh, legal conspiracy collusive sense? I, I'd seen no evidence of that. But, you know, the, the, they do seem to, the, the Mueller, uh, Trump and um, these right-wing groups do seem to have complementary interests, put it that way. So also on the, the issue of, of the upcoming election and the research that you've been doing, you also wrote a book about 2000, about right. the Bush, about the Bush v, v, v. Gore case, where at that point, I think it's safe to say, because I wrote a lot of stories about that at the time, that uh, the Republicans were much more willing to engage in what I would call a, a street fight the Brooks Brothers riot in Florida and so on and so forth. Do you think that the, you think the Democrats are, are better prepared this time for what may come during, uh, you know, during the next 60, 65 days? I, I do. I, I think that the Democrats are, um, th there, is, there is a different mindset than there was uh, in, in 2000. If you recall Al, Al Gore, uh, when the recount started, said, I believe this is a legal process. This is not, uh, you know, th this, this, is, this is above politics. He brought in to lead his efforts, Warren Christopher, uh, a great Los Angeles uh, resident, uh, who was a diplomat, who was not a street fighter. Um, James Baker uh, led the fight for the other side, and he had a very different approach. It was legal, it was political, it was public relations. And, you know, there were Trump, there were Trump um, supporters outside uh, the vice presidential man mansion sh sh shouting, get out of, uh, get out of uh, Cheney's house. There was the Brooks Brothers riot, as you mentioned. 
You know, I, I think there is still a temperamental difference um, between the two. I don't know how many people in your audience are familiar uh, with a woman named Jenna Ellis, who is the national legal spokesman for Donald Trump. I mean, she is someone who has tweeted uh, about how um, uh, sort of a, a birther conspiracy about uh, Kamala Harris, uh, that, you know, she might not be eligible for the presidency. She's tweeted about how only 9,000 people, not 180,000 people have died of COVID. I mean, she is, uh, you know, a full on uh, Trump acolyte and speaks in, in, in language, um, in that sort of inflammatory language. There is no democratic counterpart to her. Uh, th there is no one who is willing to be that reckless and irresponsible, but there are people um, in, in, on the democratic side who are very tough and who are willing to fight. And uh, I, so, so things are different going into uh, what may be a recount or may be a litigation posture after, um, after election day. Uh, but I don't know how different. And perhaps we'll find out. Another question from the audience. Do you think that uh, reporters are tough enough when questioning Trump at press conferences where he often makes claims that I think are clearly factually incorrect? I mean, even if you want to call them lies, they're, he often says things that are just clearly preposterous. Well, you know, I, I, I think, I, you know, my, my book, um, the, the new book, True Crimes and Misdemeanors, um, is dedicated to my fellow journalists because I am so proud of uh, the kind of work uh, journalists have done, uh, not just covering Trump, but just in general over the past uh, several years, uh, in spite of the fact that the economics of journalism have been disastrous. Henry, I don't have to tell you about that as a veteran of the Los Angeles Times, you know, what, you know how, how much smaller um, you know, many journalistic staffs are now than they used to be, or, you know, publications are simply out of business. Um, you know, I think there's this mythology that, you know, if you ask Trump the right question or say something to Trump, you know, the walls will come tumbling down. I mean, that's just not how it works. He's going to say what he's going to say. I mean, speaking at CNN, I mean, I, there has been a cultural change at CNN since I, you know, I've been there since 2002, so I've seen a good deal of history at CNN. And, you know, for a long time, the culture at CNN was, you know, to treat most everything as, you know, some agree, others differ, that, you know, just, uh, you know, pr present both sides of questions. But Donald Trump has forced a change in that behavior because uh, he's lied so much. And, you know, it started during the campaign when we started, you know, running chirons down the bottom. This wasn't my decision. This was made by, you know, people way above me in the food chain. But, you know, to start using the word false, Trump says falsely X, Y, and Z. Now, you know, we, we have said in chirons, Trump lies about X, Y, and Z. I, I you know, I, th this, is, this is a separate subject. But, you know, we, we live in an age of media polarization, too. So, you know, Trump supporters don't have to watch CNN, and they don't. I mean, they, or I don't think many of them do. Um, you know, they have their own television networks. Uh, they have their own Facebook feeds. So, um, you know, the idea that if journalists could just ask the right question, um, you know, they would expose Trump. I just, I, I just don't buy it. I mean, I, I think we've done a very good job. Um, you know, the Washington Post has kept track of, I don't know, 40,000 lies. I forgot how many lies it is. I mean, it's not like that information isn't out there. The question is, do people want to hear it? So I want to just ask you one final question and then I'll let you make a closing thing. You, it's sort of a historical perspective question, which is you've talked about the, the fact that you said that what Trump did was much worse than, than Nixon did. Nixon's forced to resign. 22 people in the Nixon administration were indicted and convicted of federal crimes. We've had a few people convicted in the Trump administration, although some have already been pardoned. What's the difference between then and now? Is it the, the different media culture? Is it the fact that Watergate was a simpler story than the stories involving Trump? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think 
you know, it, it's tough to make apples to apples comparisons, but I, I, I do think the media environment uh, had, a, had a tremendous amount to do, has a tremendous amount to do with it. Um, you know, the, 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 one of the things about American politics in, in, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, was that there were only a handful of national, national uh, news networks. And there was something called the Fairness Doctrine, where you know, there was an institutional obligation, uh, not only to be fair, but there also weren't other avenues for people to find out the, their, their, um, you know, their personal preference for the truth. Um, the, um, I mean, that, 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 that's a big difference. The other difference is the Republican Party. And, and I think one of the great developments, great in the sense of big developments of our lifetime has been the evolution of the Republican Party. You know, there used to be a moderate wing of the Republican Party. There used to be a dozen Republican senators who could honestly be described as moderates, whether it was Packwood in Hatfield in Oregon or Stafford in Vermont or Chafee in Rhode Island or um, you know, Chuck Percy in Illinois, or Arlen Specter in Pennsylvania. I mean, these, John Heinz in Pennsylvania, this was a big part of the Republican Party. They're gone, they are all gone. There is no more moderate wing of the Republican Party. And I think that um, has a, a, a broad political impact. And uh, if you look at how uh, Republicans uh, behave towards Trump. Now, they don't appear to be a majority of the country. Um, you know, his, his polling numbers, you know, the, the, the story of the, of the polling numbers is, is the incredible stability. You know, Donald Trump has been supported by about 40, 42% of the public from the day he was inaugurated to today. Now, given the, the way the electoral vote works, that may be enough for him to get reelected. But He's not a popular person or a popular president, but his base has stuck with him. And as he likes to say, we'll see what happens. So the clock is running on us. Any closing words you want to uh, want to add? Well, no, I, 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 Henry, this has been this has been great, and thank you to the uh, um, the. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I the the sponsoring organization. I owe, and I can say this because I'm Jewish. You know, Jews United. I don't think of Jews as like being united a lot. One of the things I love about our people is that we're, we're a disputatious lot, but uh, I get the idea and I just thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thank you for um, you know, your commitment to um, this kind of serious dialogue and um, good luck in the pandemic. Thank you for a very illuminating evening and I'm gonna turn it back to Janice now. Thank you. And I want to remind everybody also to watch the next, next week when veteran uh, Los Angeles journalist Warren Ollie will be uh, in conversation with the national political reporter Ron Brownstein. Um, that's one week from tonight, same time, same place. Hi, everybody. Thank you both for being here, both Henry and Jeff. You were fantastic to listen to. I really learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience did as well. See you all next week. Thank you again.